So hello and welcome back yet again to Christine attempting to recap chapters of a book. <laughs> we are still in book two of the Enduring Flame trilogy, which is the follow-up trilogy to the Obsidian trilogy by Mercedes Lackey and James Mallory. And it, it's been quite the journey. I mean, we started off with, with our two heroes. I mean, we, we can call them heroes. Eventually they might be. Tracell and Harrier. And Tracell discovered that he was a, a high mage, a thing that had not been seen since the time of mages in the Obsidian Trilogy. Along with this, he found out that he he was getting visions which as far as he knew were maybe something that all high mages got but the visions were were greatly disturbing to them about a lake of fire and a fire woman on said lake so he, he was feeling very disturbed he went to all of his his usual places that you could go to he went to Basically, the priests, he went to his tutors. He didn't go to his parents immediately because he was a little bit afraid to let them know that he had been messing around with magic. And eventually he finds out that the only thing he can do is hope to find a wild mage. So he and his very best friend, Harrier, set off to find a wild mage and have all sorts of adventures along the way before being told that they should go and see the elves. This is a very long journey in which they meet Ankeldar, the dragon from the first trilogy, who takes them to see Germain and over a whole lot of things ends up journeying with them as Tercel's new bonded. They also meet a unicorn who brings the three books of wild magic to Harrier and uh, lets Harrier know that he's going to be a night mage. Isn't that just exciting? The Unicorn Kirta is annoying, but uh, she seems to have improved a great deal, which is good. Harrier and Tercel travel through the Elven lands and beyond with their troop of magical animals. And when we left, Ankeldar finally has gotten a glimpse of the visions that Tercel has been having and lets them know that, uh, yeah, he recognizes the flavor of magic, demonic, but he can't tell him anything because it's a new, new form. Harrier is not thrilled about this. Not only is he now a night mage, he's, he, absolutely convinced he's going to be a terrible one because he knows nothing about fighting and on they go so that's that's kind of a very very loose retelling of where we are in the story i'm going to attempt to recap two chapters tonight because two seems like a very nice number and we're going to be recapping chapters eight and nine of the phoenix endangered by mercedes lackey and james mallory beginning with chapter eight on the shore of the lake of fire chapter eight opens up with a brief description of the mandirian desert again and the area that Bisochim is leading the Isvani people to, and that area is in the Baraleth, which if you remember, Sharia, the only member or the only tribe of the, the Isvani, her tribe, the Nalzinder, are also in the Baraleth. Probably a different part though. And Bisochim has made a a garden grow in this inhospitable place because of the power that he shares with the dragon that he is bonded to, Saravase. And we get a little description of the 
let's put some big air quotes around this, the people that used to live in the Barrelath. Quoting from the book, the fire sprites were only one of the many races which had been destroyed utterly by the Indarkin because they had fought for the light. The Bareleth had been their home, for water had been as destructive to them as fire was to those that they named the children of water. And though rain might fall elsewhere in the Izvai, scantily, and at rare intervals, there was never rain in the Bareleth. Even the most powerful wild mage could not coax water to the surface of its sands, and as hot as it was elsewhere in the desert, it was hotter here. This was a place over which hawks did not fly by day, for the heat was too punishing, and owls and bats did not fly through the air at night, for there was nothing in its sky or upon its sands which to hunt. So this is the place where not only the Nalzindar, but where Bisoshim is leading all of the rest of the tribes of the Isvani. Now, Bisoshim might be the greatest wild mage in a very long time, and that is because he is bonded to Saravase. That is also his downfall, because that is the reason that he has decided that that darkness must be brought back into the world. Now, even before he brings the Izvai people to his fortress, he had actually built it a long time ago because he knows that he has to find a place that touches the same place, a, a great power shrine, to be able to even get a blueprint of the darkness. So he had already made this fortress and it is beautiful and amazing because of Saravase's power. He's been able to call up water from way deep down in the earth and made gardens. And this is where he is, he is bringing his Isvani people. And he's looking around and he's pretty darn pleased with what he's done. Quoting, For many years, since he had first come to the Fire Sprite Shrine to begin his studies on how to restore the true balance, one vision had haunted him. And this is the main reason that he is so concerned about Tercel and Harrier, and the reason that he's been trying to send things towards them. He called up what he considers an echo of the Fire Sprite's god, and he had also sent cold after them. And now we get to see exactly why. He stands upon the ramparts of his fortress in the vision, looking out over the sand. Below him, two vast armies gallop towards each other, weapons glittering in the sun. One is his. One belongs to the enemy. He raises his hands, summoning up the sand wind. It is their only hope. It will destroy the enemy's army, but it will also destroy his own. Then he hears Saravase's scream, and he knows in that moment that an army of merely human warriors is not the enemy's only weapon. So this is the vision that has been haunting him. This is the reason that he went to all of the tribes to gather them together, because he's pretty sure he can forestall this vision. And he says that, well, he lives. No, this vision will not come to pass. He conjured up the shadow of the god of the fire sprites, and he had sent it forth to destroy his enemy. And... He, he thinks, though, just, just as a smart hunter doesn't only bring one bowstring, well, the light probably only won't have Tercel in its arsenal. And he thinks to himself, quoting yet again, He knew that there were many who would name him foolish and even wicked for setting his will against the light. Everyone was taught. He had been taught that the light was always good. 
but the children of the desert should know better. Light scoured, light blinded, light killed. It was darkness that was the friend and ally of the desert born, and the truth that all wild mages should have understood without any need for Bisochim to teach it to them was that both light and dark were vital to the balance. It was for this reason, first of all, that he had worked to restore the true balance by bringing darkness back into the world. The fact that he could save his bonded from dying at the end of his brief life because he would no longer die at all, that just added urgency to his task. For Saravasi's sake, he must survive or succeed. And there we see the, I think, the indarkened, in whatever form they are in, their greatest weapon is actually love which it seems so contradictory for love to be turned to evil, but that is, from what we learned in the Obsidian Trilogy, also the biggest thing that turned the Wild Mages to the side of darkness. Because as everybody knows, darkness is not gone from this world. There are still evil things that happen, there are still, you know, bad things. There's still disease. There's still death. It's just the world is in balance. And somehow Biso Chim has deluded himself into thinking that it's not there anymore. Now, Biso Chim, he leads the Isvani people, minus the Nalzindar tribe, all the way through the Bareleth, guiding them along with all of their flocks and all of their herds and everything, and he settles them in his fortress, where they, they can now, as far as he's concerned, live in peace and plenty and happiness, you know? And, and then he can turn his mind to the greater problem of restoring darkness back into the, the world, now, he's not totally stupid. He doesn't actually want darkness loose in the world. He just thinks that he needs to allow the possibility of darkness. You know, just let, let a little piece of darkness into the world and then lock it up somewhere. And there we go. Poof. Instant balance. And he's going to be immortal, which means that Saravase will be immortal and everything will be wonderful. And... So he brings his Isvani to, to his fortress. Now, along with the Nalzindar, there were a few other conspicuous absences amongst the people that he brings to his fortress. Most conspicuous are the other blue robe wild mages, because unlike where Harrier and Tercel are from, where wild mages are now all working in secret, in the Mandarian desert, wild mages don bright blue robes because they are vital to their people. They heal, they turn aside the sand wind, and they guide their people to water. So they're vital and known and honored, and there are none in the group that that Biso Chim brings to his fortress, and he's like, huh, all right, obviously, they're probably deluded and thinking that, that I am the enemy. So Biso Chim does some scrying, and he goes down to his very special place under the Fire Sprite Shrine, and he casts his blood and powdered bone upon the surface of the water that's down there to see what the wild mages are actually doing. And he, he finds them. In the vision, he sees them gathering together, looking very grim and purposeful, and getting ready to set out in search of the tribes of people that they are sworn to protect. Bisochim can't let them do this because obviously he can't fight all of these wild mages all together and they might 
tell his Isvani followers that he's a liar. So he summons Sandwins and he kills all of the desert's wild mages. Uh, after doing that, he sleeps exhausted, but well pleased with himself. I mean, he feels bad that he has now killed all of these wild mages, but he tells himself it's for Saravase, it's for the greater good, it's for the true balance, and after he does all of his magic and he's sure that there are no more wild mages anywhere in the desert, he sleeps. A little while later, one of his automaton, I guess, servants that he has made wakes him up and lets him know that his Isvani, his, his people, they're fighting. And Nisochim gets very frustrated, and he goes up and he sees that, yes, his, his Isvani are fighting, and he thinks to himself that he probably should have known that this was going to happen. These tribes were never meant to live packed in a small place together. They were used to roaming the entire desert, and here, where he has made this beautiful garden, they don't have to work, so they're bored, so they're fighting with each other. He scolds them, and that kind of works a little bit for now, but he's going to have to think of something for them to do so that they can not be bored and turn their thoughts to fighting. And he looks around and he's like, huh, all right, we've got the Adante Isvani, the Kamazan Isvani, the Kaluabana, the Barnatar, there's the Thaludi, there's the Kadastar, there's the Tunang. Where are the Nelzindar? And he thinks about it for a while. And then he goes and seeks out Liafa. She is the ruler of the Kaidastar Isvani, and she is probably one of the oldest of the Isvani in existence. She has married and been widowed three times. She's had dozens of children, and she is very wise. He goes to her and... After a lot of small talk, he brings up what he really wants to bring up, which is the fact that amongst all of those here in this place that I have prepared, I do not see the Nalzindar. And she agrees, and they talk a little bit about how the Nalzindar were always the smallest tribe. Maybe, maybe they just all disappeared. Leofa lets him know that no, um, right before we all headed here, somebody saw Sharia, and so obviously they were around when you were telling us all about what we must do and telling us all about the balance, and this makes Bisochim think and worry, because obviously that means that Sharia was there. And obviously that means that she's probably taken all of the Nalzindar somewhere. He knows that Sharia would no, law, no more leave the deep desert and head to the Atreyu cities than, than she could sprout wings and fly. So obviously she's somewhere. And he thinks to himself that the Nalzindar were hiding and that... No one hid from their friends. And he wonders if maybe one of those wild mages that he slayed maybe got to Sharia and poisoned, dripped poison in her ears and turned her against him. Or maybe it was the light itself trying to raise the Nelzindar as a, a an enemy. And... He also thinks that after killing all of the wild mages, he isn't 
really sure that he can bring himself to kill another entire tribe. But he does have to find them. And he thinks, you know, he'll find them. He'll just keep an eye on them. They can do whatever they want. And once he's restored the true balance, well, then it wouldn't even matter. You know, once the true balance is restored, then Sharia can think whatever she wants. It won't matter at all anymore. But he's got to find them first. And to that end, quoting... It had been many years since any task Biso Chim had set his will to had been beyond his means. There were only two things Biso Chim had not yet accomplished. He had not yet restored the true balance, and he had not yet won back Saravase's love. He's pretty sure that, you know, the first one, restoring the true balance, that just needs some more time, and once he does that, well, then he'll have eternity to win back Saravase. So he's like, you know what? No problem. I can find the Nalzindar. And so he summoned Saravase to his side. She came when he called her, as she must, but she would no longer speak to him. She had not spoken in years. Even when he spoke to her, even when he begged her to speak, her silence filled him with a dull, heavy anger. How dare she mock him with silence, she who had once been so bright and clever, sharing her stories of far lands and centuries in the hours that they had spent together in a thousand places upon the sand. He loved her even now. And between them, even though he loves her, he can feel her grief. She can feel her anger. Grief and anger bound them where once there had been only love and joy. But he knows no matter what she is thinking about him, she is subservient to his will, and so they fly out across the desert looking for the Nalzindar. And they look for about a fortnight. They can't find anything. It took him... A while, every time he goes back to his fortress to eat and drink and sleep, although he doesn't need to sleep very often anymore now, he usually just relies upon his spells to sustain him. But every time he returns, he can see that the Isvani who are there are getting more tense. His scolding did not work. He knows that they are going to soon probably break into the one thing that he doesn't want, which is war amongst themselves. So he calls a council of the leaders of all of the tribes, and he speaks to them about the fact that the Nalzindar are not there. And he lets them know that he has searched for them and he can't find them, which means that they're probably being held prisoner somewhere. And so he creates a holy crusade calling on all of the, the warriors of the tribe to ride forth and try to find the Nalzindar. It's kind of like the quest for the Holy Grail, desert edition, except in this, Biso Chim knows that if he can't find them, Nobody can find them, and he's kind of hoping that if they go out and wander around in the desert for a while and search, then they'll be so happy to come back to his beautiful garden fortress that there won't be any more fighting, and no matter what, there won't be any more fighting while they're gone, which is good. He also, to do this, calls up permanent wells all the way across the Baraleth, leading back to the regular Isvani desert. He knows that doing this is going to throw the balance of the desert off, but uh, it's worth it, he thinks. It's absolutely worth it. And by the time the tribes get tired of their fruitless quest, well, everyone will be peaceful and happy and wonderful. And, you know, 
maybe they'll actually find the Nelzindar. It's probably not going to happen, but it might. So he's fairly happy. And he thinks that if the enemy, which is light, has killed the Nelzindar, well, they will definitely pay the price with all of these warriors out looking for them. But no, he, he really thinks that the Nelzindar are hidden and prisoners of the enemy, or the enemy's willing and deluded slaves. And that is where chapter 8 ends with all of the warriors of the, the Isvani tribes heading out in small groups, because they're not silly, no matter what, even with wells being called up across the deep desert, it's... I, you gotta remember these wells are little, so small groups dispersing across the, across the desert on their own version of the, the Holy Grail search. Which, uh, or maybe it would be a wild goose chase probably a wild goose chase. And there again we see that Bisochim is very much deluded. And it's funny because I was thinking about it. And in the first trilogy, in the Obsidian trilogy, it was so... I mean, I love that trilogy. It's fantastic. But it was, very, it was a very simple story at its heart. It was good versus evil, and there really weren't too many shades of gray in between. Like, the Indarkins, the demons, were evil. There was nothing in any of the writing that gave you a shade of gray to them. They were just plain bad. And even if the forces of light had a little more shading to them, they were still the forces of light, shining and good. So at its heart, the Obsidian Trilogy is your, your very basic good versus evil and good, hopefully triumphing in the end. Triumphing? Is that actually a word? Triumphing, we'll go with it, in the end. This trilogy is a little more nuanced. And I don't know if that's better or worse. Like I've said so many times, I don't know which trilogy I like better. It depends on, I guess, my mood when I'm reading. But this one is a, a little bit more nuanced because even though Biso Chim is the enemy, you can kind of understand where he's coming from. He's not doing anything out of malice. He's doing it out of love. He's just twisted, and it makes the story a little bit more interesting in, in all of its, like, twisties. That didn't come out the way I wanted it to. But it does make the story a lot more nuanced, and uh, there's a lot more, a lot more like morally gray areas. I don't know if I were bonded to a dragon, if I would be really, really all that sanguine about the fact that at the end of my very short mortal life, this dragon, which is partner, I mean, not love, but, well, love, just not like the love between partners, but, you know, in some ways closer than that, like your greatest friend, your greatest love, your greatest partner, I don't know that I would be able, able to be cool with the fact that when my lifespan ended, that would mean that theirs would too. So I can see why Biso Chim would be searching for any shred of hope that, you know, maybe they didn't have to die. Or at least not 
die together. So, interesting. Anyway, I'm going to get a drink, and then we're going to do the next chapter where Harrier and, and Tercel and Ann Kildar are on the road again. All right, so chapter nine is titled A Feast for Crows. And we rejoin Harrier and Tercel and Kerta and Ann Kildar as they are bumping their way through the woods outside of the elven lands now. And Ann Kildar keeps telling Harrier that there's, there, there is a road up ahead and Harrier, he doesn't actually doubt Ann Kildar, but he doesn't know why there would be a road out here. But, you know... That, that is just sort of what it is. Ann Kildar also lets them know that there's a lake up ahead, and that's good because without Kerta, they wouldn't be even drinking because water has become much harder to find outside of the elven lands. They're still in the woods. They're not anywhere near the desert yet, but it's still one of those things. Harrier fusses a little bit about the fact that Yes, they could desperately all use a washing, and their clothes could use a washing, but it's also edging towards winter, and that's going to be kind of cold and yucky. They deal with it, and they're, they're heading towards the lake. Before they get to that lake, though, Harrier has cause to be very happy that Kerta is with them, because she leads them to a tiny little spring that she purifies, and that's, that's a very good thing, because they were actually out of water when she found it. And Kerta being Kerta, well, quoting. And then Harrier spent the rest of the afternoon and that evening listening to Kerta preen about how indispensable she was. At least when she was rejoicing in her own cleverness, Kerta wasn't nagging him to do a spell. Harrier might be willing to read the three books when he could get the time to do it, but he was damned if he would do any magic. Tercel could make all the cold fire and light all of the fires that they needed. Harrier had no intention of doing anything that would involve him with this mysterious mage debt and mage price. He didn't understand it very well, but Mage Price sounded a little bit like a mortgage. You got something, a spell, and then you had to pay for it later. And what he knew about mortgages was that the captain who could not pay one lost his ship. Harrier didn't think the wild magic worked the same way, but he didn't know how it did work. He was sure at least pretty sure, that it couldn't be something bad, but right now, he and Tercel could not afford even something inconvenient. So Harrier is still, still being very resistant to the whole magic idea. They get to the lake, finally, and they get a nice big fire going. They take a bath. And Harrier thinks it would be nice if magic was actually useful instead of just silly. After their bath, Tercel requests Harrier to, you know, read him something from one of his three books. If, if he could, you know, if, if it's allowed. And Harrier's like, I don't know if it's allowed or not. I didn't have anybody teaching me about all this stuff. So he is like, fine, I'll read you something out of one of my books. Kerta mocks him a little bit, and Harrier says, Shut up, said Harrier absently. He chose a passage at random, and he began to read. The Night Mage is the active agent of the principle of wild magic. The Wild Mage, who chooses to become a warrior, 
or who is born with the instinct for the way of the sword, who acts in battle without mindful thought and thus brings primary causative forces into manifestation by direct action. Huh, said Tercel. Well, without mindful thought, pretty much describes you. So they, they discuss the whole idea of being a night mage. And he, he still doesn't understand it. He says, so what this is saying is that night mages are just instinctually knowing the way of the sword. And Kerta, Kerta and Tercel both agree that that's what it sounded like. Kerta says, Aren't you sorry now that you didn't take those lessons from those nice elves that offered? And Harrier's like, well, gee, maybe if you would have shown up sooner to tell me that I needed to, they probably would have been happy to stick around and teach me sword fighting, you know, since they would be the first people since Germain to train an actual night mage. And Kerta is like, it doesn't work like that. And Keldar then finally lets Tercel and Harrier in on the big limitation behind a unicorn. Eulerian and Rilfendel were not chaste and virginal, and Keldar said, in tones indicating that he had no interest in listening to another argument tonight. Kerta could not approach you when they were near. Harrier thought back. What were practically the first words that Kerta had said to him? I thought those two would never leave. Hmm, that must be why. He couldn't make up his mind whether to turn red or burst out laughing in disbelief, and from Tercel's expression, neither could he. Oh, he finally said. And that pretty much ends that discussion for the night. Everybody heads off to bed. Later on, about a sun night later, Harrier thinks to himself that he doesn't know where they're going, but now that they're on a road again, they're making really good time to wherever this road is taking them. Kerta wants to know why he's so grumpy when they're moving along, and he's like, I would really like to know why there's a road here. They bicker a little bit more. She tells him that he should do a magic spell, obviously. Harrier says no. And Kertz is like, well, you have to do magic sometime. And again, Harrier says no. And she's like, you could just summon yourself up a nice little sword teacher. You know you need one. Har Harrier is like, and what would the mage price for that be? Kerta is trying to convince him as best as she can that it probably wouldn't be too bad, or, or maybe he could just, you know, practice casting fire or something along those lines. Their argument gets broken off when Harrier notices buzzards circling up ahead and landing. Obviously, there's something dead on the road and something big enough to, to gather an entire flock of vultures. They hurry as much as a wagon being pulled by draft horses can hurry, and they see that it's, uh, it's a dude on the side of the road. A dude trapped under a horse. The guy has filthy, blood-soaked robes and he was obviously killed probably by his horse that rolled onto him and Keldar and Tercel land and Anne Keldar pulls the dead horse off of the man I guess we should bury him said Harrier crouching down beside the body the man was wearing a strange armor that didn't seem to be made out of metal the face piece had protected his eyes from the ravens not that it mattered. Better not, said Ann Kildar. He's still alive. 
with that, Harrier eases the man's helmet off and, you know, is takes a good look at him, feels his neck, actually finds a pulse, although the dude is very, very cold. And he's like, uh, this guy's not going to be alive for much longer. Obviously, he was hurt even before the horse had fallen on him. And the horse has been laying on him for who knows how long. And he looks up at Tercel and he's like, uh, yeah, he's probably going to die soon unless you can, y you know, do a spell. A healing spell. Tercel's voice was flat. He shook his head. I don't know whether the high magic doesn't have them or if Jermaine just didn't have those books, but I don't know any. You have to. Me? Harrier's voice was almost a shout. He'll die, said Tercel. Fine, how much water do we have? Apparently, he had made up his mind to heal the man without thinking. They try to figure out what to do. Harrier tells everyone that they at least have to move the man, so bring the, the blanket. And they kind of ease him out of some of his armor. Harrier does notice that the guy has two swords crossed up high on his back, and he thinks that maybe he's seen swords like that before, but right now he's a little bit more worried about this whole how he's supposed to heal anything. Ann Keldar offers advice, but that's about all he can offer. He's seen plenty of healings. And Tercel wants to know if there's anything that he can do to help. And Harrier's like, I don't know, make tea, boil water, I find me a piece of charcoal. He wiped his hands as clean as he could, and he started digging through his bag. He had pulled out the tiny brazier. He thought that he was going to need it. And then he pulled out the Book of the Moon. Real wild mages might know how to do these things off the top of their heads, but he didn't. Okay, okay, I've got this. Willow, ash, you, burn them, hair, blood. Oh, yuck. Oh, and here are the words. It looks simple. If it was this simple, everybody would do it. Eternal light, this isn't going to work. But when Harrier came back with the charcoal, all Harrier said was, Looks easy enough. Now, if you don't mind, light that for me, because I'll be damned if I'm going to learn two spells in one day. Tercel lights up the brazier and also says, where did Kirta go? Harrier points out that this guy probably has a wife and kids back home waiting for him, and obviously they, you know, make Kirta uncomfortable, so she's gotten back far as she can. He tells Tercel to just, you know, go keep her company or something. And then he gets down to it. Quoting. Hair from the person to be healed. Blood from the person to be healed. Not that hard when the stranger was covered in it and top it all off, moving him had started his shoulder wound bleeding again. Hair from the wild mage. That was him. Not too hard. His blood. Harrier took a deep breath and ran his thumb over the blade of his small belt knife. Not his eating knife, that one wasn't sharp, but the one that he wore to use for any little tasks that needed doing. A sharp knife is a safe knife, his dad had always said, telling him that more fools cut themselves on dull knives than ever on a properly honed blade. Da, if you could see me now. Harrier was nervous, so he pressed harder than he meant to, and only realized he had cut himself when he felt the blood running down his wrist. He swore, scrambling to soak the ball of hair in his blood and then throw it onto the charcoal. Almost as an afterthought, he tossed on the leaves. Light blast it, this had better work. As the hair spat and crackled, Harrier realized that wasn't exactly what he was supposed to say. Um, Light, this is Harrier. I want you to heal this guy, and I guess there's a mage price I'm supposed to pay, and I'm supposed to pay it willingly, and 
I don't want him to die, but I don't want anything to happen to Tercel either. And I've known him longer, so if I could uh, just help Tercel first before I have to go off someplace and do something for you, that'd be great, because I'd be happy to do it, okay? Anything. But, you know, this is important, and Harrier obviously doesn't have this whole bargaining with the light thing down. And he's frustrated, and suddenly it just starts to work. Suddenly he, he just steps aside, holds out his hands, and feels a presence, a power, strong and sweet and wild, and he doesn't have to tell it what to do. It wasn't a power that you tell what to do. All that he has to do is offers himself to work through. He didn't know how long he spent watching the body beneath his hands come back into true, but he knew, he sensed, he saw that the work was almost done, and in moments this power would be depart. Tell me, he thought, what do you need? What do you want? He didn't know what he expected to hear. He didn't hear anything at all. He just had a sense of remembering and a feeling like a key turning in a lock. You must become an apprentice. And that was the last thing that Harrier knew for a very long time. So obviously healing accomplished. His mage price is to become an apprentice. And then Harrier passes out. He wakes up about uh, two days later with Kerta and and Tercel very worried about him, and Anne Keldar saying he's fine, this happened, obviously because he had no one to share in the price of a major healing. If you remember all of the other wild mage healing spells, except for Adalia's, because all of her prices had already been paid, required a lot of people to help, and if they didn't, well then, most of that magic energy comes from the mage themselves. So Harrier wakes up and he's a little bit grumpy, but the first thing he wants to know is, did the dude survive? And the second thing he wants to know is, wow, Kerta actually came close to close enough to see if I was okay? He's a little bit touched by that, but she retreats really far back immediately. And Harrier would like to go and tell her that he was, you know, a little bit touched by it, but uh, it seems like a really long way away, and he's still really tired and really hungry. Tercel follows Harrier as he hobbles his way over to the wagon and asks for something to eat and drink. And Tercel, of course, would like to know what it was like. And Harrier says, what, getting knocked on my ass for two days? I'm pretty sure whatever I did, it was wrong. That's when Anne Kildar pipes up with the fact that it was because there wasn't anyone to share the price of the healing. And again, Tercel asks what it was like, and Harrier just can't really find the words to explain it. Nice? Yeah. Awful? Also, yeah. Was it terrifying? Wonderful? It was all true, and now he kind of really understands that the high magic and the wild magic are very different. Because the high magic, as far as Harrier knows, is a magic that anybody could learn. But now that he's actually done a spell, Harrier knows that the wild magic is not something that you learn. It's just something that you let move through you. And all he can really sum it up to Tercel is, I've never been good at listening. And then he lets him know that it's probably nothing like the spells that you do. And I don't know if I could say what it was like. You're the one who reads all the books. Tercel lets him know that uh, his books don't tell him anything about the wild magic. And Harrier's like, I don't know. Next time you become a, a wild mage, I'll be the, uh, the night mage. Or 
you become the night mage, I'll be the high mage. And then he says, you know, the guy I healed obviously was wounded, probably was riding, and maybe the people who were chasing him and wounded him were still around, because he just realized that he's been two days past out. Tercel says that, uh, no, we, we thought about that. We looked around, and there were a bunch of horses. We found a bunch of dead people, but, but nobody alive anywhere near here. Harrier still worries a little bit that maybe the guy that they rescued was a bandit. That could be bad. And then finally, after eating three bowls of stew and a lot of water, he decides to go and see Kerta. He has a little bit of a conversation with Kerta where she's like, you did a spell, good job. And they, they bicker as they always do. And then Harrier goes back to see if maybe the the stranger that he healed is ever going to wake up. When he gets back to the wagon, Tercel is actually helping the stranger sit up. The stranger looks around and he's like, oh wow, I'm alive. And he looks at Tercel and he looks at Harrier and he's like, neither of you are wearing blue robes. Neither of the boys knows what that means, and Tercel's like, uh, were the people in blue robes after you? And the guy's like, no, why would wild mages be after me? And then he explains that in the south, in the desert, the Mandarian, the wild mages wear blue robes so that all know and honor them. Harrier being Harrier, says, well, that's dumb. If everybody knows you're a wild mage, won't they all be bothering you to, you know, do things? The man, whose name is the Telchi, says, in the Mandarian, we depend on the wild mages for life itself, and it would be foolish to offend one of you. He looks, trying to figure out which one of them is the wild mage, and Harrier's like, oh, yeah, I, I kind of sort of healed you. And this is Tercel, and, and we're from Arameth, and my name's Harrier, and then Anne Kildar pokes his head around the wagon and almost gives the Telchi a heart attack, because who's expecting to see a dragon when you were just almost killed and then healed? The Telchi lets Harrier know that he is not actually from the Mandarian Desert, which Harrier was starting to suspect because he remembers where he had seen swords like that before. The Telchi is evidently a Selkin, which is a group of people from far across the Great Ocean, and Harrier has seen Sel Selkins on the dock with swords like the Telchis. They don't get much else out of the Telchi before he falls asleep again, because being healed from being almost dead is very, very exhausting. The boys are like, well, at least we know that we're approaching the Mandarian Desert, since that's where the Telchi says that he lives now. That's something, right? And that's pretty much where the chapter ends. So, Harrier has rescued a Selkin who is now living in the desert, and he's done his very first high ma or wild magic spell. Yay, good job, Harrier. Kerta was very pleased by that, and Harrier, well, I don't think he was very pleased by it. He does not seem to like the idea of magic at all, and... I would say I can't blame him, but at the same time, being able to do magic would be kind of cool. I also really, really love the idea of Anne Kildar poking his head out and this poor dude who's like, wow, I'm alive? This is, this is pretty cool. And then you just see a dragon poke their head out from around a 
big old wagon and you almost probably wet yourself. I would. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for listening. I hope that that made sense. Um, tell me what you think about what I was saying. Do you feel like this, this series is a little bit more complex than the first trilogy? I really do like Bisochim as an enemy because you can sympathize with him. But on the same note, sometimes I really like a story like the Obsidian Trilogy where it's very black, you've got demons, they're bad. It's, it's very easy and clear cut. It's a little bit harder in this series because I do feel bad for Biso Jim. And I do understand how he could fall to the dark. That doesn't mean I think he's a good guy and that doesn't mean I think he's right. But you can understand it more. And then hope that maybe... Maybe before he actually brings the fire woman into the world, maybe he'll wake up and figure out what's what's wrong. Not going to hold my breath, but we can all hope. Anyway, thank you for listening. As I babbled and babbled and babbled, um, please do leave a thumbs up. If you don't mind, it does always make me smile. And I will see you next time.